Hey, y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, my good sis, my Ish, actress Aisha Hines talks to me about replenishment and the people who help her restore her wholeness. Ooh, okay, this one's personal. So for the last three years, I have decided to choose a word that I feel is representative of what I hope to hold on to as the anchor of my year. And this year, I chose replenishment. I can honestly say I've been on a growth path that has me feeling like there's been so much poured out of me and very little poured in. But I'm trusting God to replenish me in all areas of my life. 2020 and 2021 were absolute doozies. I mean, so tough, but so beautiful. I knew that eventually the world would open back up and I wanted to be as prepared as possible. This podcast is one of the ways he's already pouring into me. What was only a dream four years ago is now a reality. Today, Aisha and I get into the difficult work of pursuing wholeness and what it takes to leave the past behind and open yourself up to new possibilities. In my conversation with Aisha, we laughed, we cried, but most importantly, we filled each other's cup. I didn't even see myself as Harriet Tubman. Wow. And it took Anthony like coming to me like, listen, I think you should make a, a, a ploy for, 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 for Harriet. You should take a go. I really want you to play Harriet. It's good to have a person. It's good. To, and so he was my person. Mm. He planted the seed of possibility in my mind. And I was like, oh, I never, I didn't, I never thought of myself as playing Harriet Tubman because I had been a working actress who always did a certain kind of thing. Mm. And in our Sankofa moment, Aisha talks to us about the trailblazer she'd take on a trip to the places that made her who she is and the adventures they'd get into. First thing we're doing is probably going to the beach. We're going to go to mm. that good old Grand Anne's and we're going to replenish, okay? Because she put in her. Oh my goodness. And she deserves. She deserves to lay out and be loved on. She deserves. She yeah. deserves a frozen drink in one hand. She mm. deserves a foot massage. Ash. Ish. Ash. Ash. <laughs> ABFJ. <laughs> ah. MBD. No, BD. BD. What? This is a big deal. Oh. <laughs> it is a big deal, sis. I'm so happy for you. Thank you, sis. And, and every big deal of my life, you have to be a part of. Wow. Well, thank you. Ashley, you know how much I love you. And we could truly spend this entire <laughs> session lathering each other in love. Ish. Do you remember when we met? Was it at Anthony Hemingway's? I think so, which New sounds Year's. insane because I obviously met you in 1935. <laughs> <laughs> when we were just yes. stomping up the Savoy. <laughs> yeah. We were clearly here before. 1,000%. As friends, yeah. probably sisters. It's fine. For sure. So, yeah, we met at director and friend Anthony Hemingway's uh, it was New a New Year's, Year's Eve, Eve and I think that was New Year's Eve 2011. That sounds about I think we're going into 2012, so a decade. Yeah. And you, again, you're just, it. we met and... Never look back. Never look back. It's like, I don't even remember like a warm-up in friendship. Negative. Like a, I don't even remember somebody <sighs> being like, hey, this is Ashley, Ashley, Aisha. No. I just think we jumped in. Like, like it was just like, oh, yeah, we're friends. Yeah. Duh, obviously. Okay, see you next week. See you tomorrow. Okay, Here's fine. my number. Right. I'll see you on FaceTime tomorrow morning. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, I just, I love, I love those types of friendships. And the older you get, the more you realize that they're so special. You know, and I think that's an ode to you, Ash, honestly, because I think that you lead with authenticity. Mm -hmm. Like, it oozes from you, you know? Because I met a lot of people that night that I didn't know and I was meeting for the first time. But you rose to the top. You listen so well. Like, it's Thank you so insane. much. Yes. Oh my, that is one of the best compliments I've ever gotten. <laughs> well, you know, that's what I'm here Eesh, for. Eesh, that like really touched me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. It's I true. really try. Yeah. I remember during the pandemic, I was literally like at the edge of myself because I was like entering into the foray of homeschooling with my nephew and, like, you were the first person that I, like, left my house 
to actually be in person <laughs> with and connect. <laughs> I, I see. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You had me out here. <laughs> One thing about me, I'm gonna get somebody out in these streets. Oh hits. You gonna oh, be oh hits for sure. You had me oh hits. Yes. And it was replenishing. Oh yeah. It always is though. It was so replenishing. And I'm... we're just getting started. And I, I, you know what else is funny? Replenishment is my word for the year. Wow. Replenishment. I want to be replenished. Yeah. 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 You deserve to be. Thank you, sis. All right. Well, I want to talk about the beginning. I want to talk about Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. What did Brooklyn teach you? Uh, Brooklyn taught me, I think, resilience Mm. before I even knew what the word was or before I even knew that it was being formed in me. And what I mean by that is that I had sort of had an image in my mind that was informed a lot by the images that I saw on television. And at that time, when I was growing up, you know, there were few images um, on television that I could really resonate with, you know? And so I grew up in the in the era of A Different World, The Jeffersons, The Cosby Show. And so even on those shows, I didn't really particularly see myself. And mm-hmm. so I just kind of inserted myself and inserted my family into the dynamics of 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 these families that I was seeing, you know? And so I decided that my family was the Cosby show, <laughs> was the Cosby <laughs> family. Yeah. You know, I decided that, you know, I had a working professional dad and, you know, and my mom was a working professional and, and you know, and we were well off in my mind, you know? Mm. I just imagined that one day we too would have a house and it would have a staircase that goes upstairs. And so my room would be upstairs. But the reality was <laughs> mm. I lived in an apartment, <laughs> you know, and so I shared a room with my brother. And before we were able to move out into our own apartments, we lived with my grandmother, you know, and it was like a like a four apartment family home in the 90s. For those of you who know Brooklyn and the 90s, then my family started breaking apart. My parents divorced and they were they separated actually when I was probably around 14. Okay. And divorced well after I graduated from college. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so they were separated for a long time. But at that time, I didn't even have language. I didn't know what was happening. All I knew was that the dynamic that my family that I had grew up in and that the plan that I had for it and the vision it was dissipating right before my eyes. Mm. And so I found myself sort of still clinging to the need for that dynamic. I needed family, you know, which I think is what informed my friendships Mm. from that point on, you know, because my grandmother would always say to me, like, you have a lot of friends, we. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, you know... I didn't even realize that I was trying to replace what was 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 disappearing, wow. you know, at my, at my fingertips, which was like the closeness of family, you know. And so I remember going through, finishing out high school, going into college and starting to feel like, oh, man, I don't have parents. You know, like I have my mom and I have my dad, but because they're not together, I don't have parents, mm. which kind of spoke you know, to my own sense of identity. You know, I felt fractured because now, you know, this this unit, you know, had come apart. And so I had been in pursuit of of wholeness for quite a long time and, and being brought back together, you know, the pieces being brought back together and didn't realize that that too showed up in my friendship choices, relationship choices, you know, from that point onwards. It wasn't until, you know, literally maybe 17 minutes ago, (laughs) but literally just a few years when I started to start the personal work on myself that I was able to connect the dot of how I became Mm. the way that I became, you know, and kind of like what were some of those root experiences that informed why I was the way that I was and what was I in pursuit of and what did I lose and what was I lacking and what did I love and what, you know, so, but now in this, more informed place in my life, I think it was the best decision for for our family mm. to move in the direction that that it did move in. 
Well, what direction did it move in? Well, my my mom and my dad ended up divorcing. My mom ended up re- remarrying mm-hmm. later on in life. She moved to Georgia. She left New York and moved to Georgia. But the funny thing is before she moved to Georgia, she moved to Florida. Mm-hmm. And it was around my senior year of high school. And so I was finishing high school and she had moved with her sister in Florida. And so... Had that not happened, I probably would not have gone down to Florida. I would have probably ah. stayed in Brooklyn. And when I tell you I was on the wrong path, <laughs> on the Ooh. wrong path. I like definitely— Okay. Yeah. I need, yeah. The fact that you are sitting in front <laughs> of Jet me— the Earl Grey <laughs> chamomile— <laughs> Yes. Aisha, what? Okay. Yes. Not uh, okay. I was this, old heads. What? Old heads. Okay, Ash. we're gonna we're gonna get into that. Cause <laughs> I the fact that you are sitting in front of me talking about I was headed down the wrong path. I've known you for a decade and I literally if this was a million dollar question, I would say, Aisha has never been headed down <laughs> any path other than the path to Jesus. That's it. <laughs> what? Okay. No, ma'am. Okay. No, ma'am. I was like heavy into parties. Hooky parties. That was like a big Side thing. Side note, this is the lady who is in bed by 6 p.m. Listen, 559 if, if, if it's a good day. Which is why I tell people all the time, I started so you early did it. that wow. I retired years ago. Oh. You know, and I only really come out of retirement for the right thing, the right person, the right time. And when you come out. I'm out. You are <laughs> out. Cut okay. to your birthday party the yeah. other day. <laughs> My birthday party was lit. It was lit. Yes, it was. Okay. So, yeah. So, I was, you know, around like 12, 13, 14. I was like in the parties. Like in the parties in Brooklyn. And they used to do this thing. Like the adult parties? Yeah. (gasps) 1,000%. Ah. Yeah. Wow. All up and down, all up and down Church Avenue, all up and down Flatbush Avenue, all up and down Empire, all up and down, all in the city, all up and down. Okay. Like me and my friend, I don't know if I should get into this, but me and my friend. <laughs> Get into it. Me and my friends would be like shoplifting at like, what's it like? Woolworths. We were in oh. Woolworths, Okay. <laughs> But that's going to require Google for this generation. (laughs) Woolworth. We were shoplifting from Woolworths, but arts and craft like things so that we could make like jeans with our names on it with like glitter and like bubble colors and like t-shirts and rip it and create the beads. (laughs) It was crazytownusa.org. And we would like put these outfits together and we would show up to these hooky parties, which was a thing in Brooklyn too. Like you were supposed to be in school, but you were really in somebody's basement. Like it was all Always like high key, low key in like somebody's basement. Get out of town. Mm-hmm. Ish. This is inappropriate. Biggie said it. <laughs> Your daughter in a Brooklyn basement. <laughs> Listen. And you were like, yeah. That's me. That's yeah. me. <laughs> oh. Like if Biggie said it, it is so. I follow the gospel according to Biggie Smalls. Oh my. <laughs> And so I was in those Brooklyn basements and, you know, ironically, it took like meeting a guy in that Brooklyn basement who like who happened to like tell me like, yeah, my sister goes to church. My sister goes to church. Like, I don't even know how that conversation, even how we even got on that conversation. Maybe he told me his sister went to church. Maybe I was at his house or something. And <laughs> she was doing something in the other room that didn't match the energy of what we were doing in the other room. <laughs> and so he was like, yo, my sister goes to church. So I was like, oh, what church is? So he told me to church. And he was like, Lennox World Baptist Church or Lennox and Nostrand. And so I was like, oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. And so like the guy and I kind of split apart for a while, but I remembered that that's where the sister went to church. So I was like, you know what? Let me position myself at the church because then maybe I might see him. And you know, the time that everybody goes to church is Easter Sunday. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to go on Easter Your Sunday. Your debut was Easter Sunday? Sunday? No, I was too strategic for that. Ashley, have we met? <laughs> I was like... <laughs> So I was like, okay, I can't be the person who's showing up to the church on Easter Sunday because I will not be the person standing when they're like, anybody here for the first time? I'm like, oh. nah, <laughs> no. So I, I went the week before Ooh. and doubled down because I was like, I'm not even going to go on the Sunday. I'm going to go on the Friday because there's a whole Good Friday service. Um. Not a lot of people go to the Good Friday service. So I don't mind standing at the Good Friday service. So here I am at the Good Friday service just prepping for Easter Sunday. 
So they give a word, can't even remember the word. But at the end of this Good Friday service, it was a good 17 people maybe there. They were like, can you stand up and hug the people around you? And there was this woman there named Sharon Downer. And she turned around and hugged me. And I mean, when you talk about all those fractured pieces, it Mm. came crumbling out of me in the form of uncontrollable tears, like heaving, heaving, heaving. And she became like a second mom figure in my life. And what I realized was, you know, this was sort of the height of where my family was, you know, coming apart. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what it was. I had never met her in my life, but something about her hug felt like home. Mm. And she literally is still in my life to this day. She literally, you know, inserted herself into my life and she was cornerstone to help in my life find a trajectory that was different from the one that I was on to the point where I was still trying to go to these parties. My father was not having it. Like he was strict. So he would literally sit up, wait till I got home, be at the door, like behind the peephole, looking out the peephole until I walked up that stair. I'm I'm Mm. tiptoeing thinking I'm, and right as I got to that final stair, the door would open all hard and I'm like (gasps) trying to run. (laughs) But um, so one time I tried to come home super late and he was like, nope, wherever you were, go back there. (gasps) I was like, oh, oh. Well, the party's over. He was like, well. (laughs) Well, the party's over. I just want to get in my bed. Right. You should have thought about (laughs) that. And he put me, he he was like, go back there. And I was literally on the corner, literally, of Linden Boulevard and Bedford Avenue. And I called Sharon. And I was like, my dad Mm -hmm. put me out. And she circled around that block. It was like 3 in the morning. Circled around, picked me up off that street. And I remember vividly, she came and got me, brought me to her house. And she was, like, somebody who was very particular about, like, her bedding and her, you know, the dining room table. Like, you've been to my house, Mm -hmm. you see. She's the person who sort of instilled that, you know? And so her bedding, I remember looking at her bedding, and it was so beautiful. And she was like, you know, go ahead and get in bed. And I was like, man, she took this dirty girl off the side of the sidewalk and put her in. And I've all—if you're West Indian, you do not get in— No bed (laughs) with one with outside clothes or with outside like energy on your body, (laughs) you know. Mm -hmm. And so she gave me a little nightgown to put on, but I don't even think that I had like taken a shower or anything. And, you know, so I remember thinking to myself like, wow. And it was restorative. It's like she restored me in that moment. And I didn't even know that I needed to be restored. But I also know that, over, you know, through the course of time where my family was separating, that I was sort of building my own set of survival mechanisms to deal with what was happening with my family. And that's why I said resilient, because I didn't know throughout the years that I was going through the things that I was going through, that I was being resilient. I just thought that, you know, I just thought I was being strong, you know, like, oh, I'm strong. I'm That don't phase me, you know, that, don't, that's, that doesn't phase me. But I didn't realize that. The little girl in me was like storing up all of that. That ner- My nervous system was storing up all of that. And so by the time I became an adult and I really started to unpack those things, I started to cry the tears of that little girl and for that little girl, yeah. you know, and feel the actual pain, you know. Yeah. And so at the time I was surviving, you know, but nowadays I'm like, Shh talking about some of these things, revisiting some of these memories, you know, I give myself grace and permission to feel those feelings, you know, to travel back and to to understand, like, what was happening and and what I extracted from that moment. And, And that moment at Sharon's house, it spoke to me because I think it was the moment that said, like, I see you and you're valuable. You're valuable mm. enough for me to come out of my bed at three o'clock in the morning and come valuable. and pick you up from the sidewalk wow. and put you in my bed, you know? And I think mm. it charged me to kind of think of myself as a little bit more valuable. Yeah. And so I showed back up at at that church mm. <laughs> on Easter Sunday and I didn't have to stand and say that I was the first one. Yeah. But now my mission had changed and now I wanted to be there. And so I joined that ministry and I was a part of that ministry for many, many years. Mm. Served in the youth ministry because that's where she served. She was like the head of the youth ministry. And for me, and that's why I also still have a heart for young people because yeah. that was the turning point for me. Oh my goodness. 
I have chills. It's it's that story is so touching because I love hearing stories about the angels that come into people's yeah. lives. She was an angel. She was an angel on she earth. Is. That is so. And I love the thought that God sent her for you in that moment. Mm-hmm. Period. I love the thought of. That was always going to happen for right. you. I love the thought that it had to take a little little trickery right. to get you there. Right. But there was a purpose. Yeah. And the purpose literally changed your life. Yeah. Like how, how divine that, a, that she was a black woman. Yeah. That a black woman saw a young black woman yeah. and said, I want to be impactful. I want to be used. Yeah. For the good of this young woman's life. Yeah. And that's who you are today. You know, when I think about your nephew, see, he's your family. Mm-hmm. But the way you swooped in and said, you're mine too. You're mine. This is nothing. I can do this. And to see you excel and thrive and really becoming a, a parent of sorts, you know, like that has been as your sister and as your friend, and we can get into it a little bit more later. That has been so incredibly inspiring to see you. You didn't bat an eyelash. You had to restructure everything. Mm-hmm. I remember when you told me that that this change was happening in your life, and you said it so like happenstance. Like, yeah, my <laughs> nephew's coming to live with me. I was like, when? You're like, oh, he'll be here tomorrow. I was like, wait. <laughs> What? You're like, yeah, I have to go to the school. I have to enroll him. I'm going to pick up some, um, yeah. what are those called? Uh, yeah, binders and backpacks. Uh, oh my goodness, snacks. I got to figure out snacks. Like you just, it was like you were just getting someone's Starbucks order. And we're like, yeah, I got to, you know, and you didn't complain. Yeah. Makes people cry. Yeah, you you know, never cry. complain. Oh my goodness, like that is the best thing about you. You don't complain. You just operate with love and from love. And I just feel so lucky to be loved by you. I really, really do. Oh my goodness. Okay, we have so much, so much more to get into. So we're going to pivot a little bit to career quickly. Love it. When Harriet... When the role of Harriet Tubman on on the brilliant show Underground came about, where were you at that time in your life, at that time in your career? And did you expect the best? I absolutely wasn't at a place where I was expecting Mm. the best because Mm -hmm. I had I was I had created a coast. I had yep. created a, a career trajectory that kept me coasting. So I was doing job after job because when I entered the industry, success was measured by your ability to just be working. Yes, yes. Not by like... What it a, is. Th- not by what it is. <laughs> the quality of the content Not the even. quality, no. not the quality of the role. Like, no. it was like, you're a working actress. Mm. That was an... Un- like, that was... A th- and especially for Black women. Yeah. I mean... So I was looked on like, what is she doing? How do you crack the code, you know, to be the working actress and not just working, but consistently working. Mm -hmm. However, at the time that Harriet came along, I don't think I was working. (laughs) (laughs) But I think, too, I had become exhausted with building a, a job after job. Like, I had curated a career that was built on jobs as opposed to like crafting out the trajectory of what I wanted my career to be, Mm. you know? I knew that I had sort of created this mission statement early in my career because I met Ava DuVernay when she was a publicist. She was the publicist on my very, very first feature film, Assault on Precinct 13. And she saw a little black girl and she was like, I'm going to ride and, and, and for this I little black girl. I didn't realize that's how you met Ava. 1,000%. What? Yeah. And I was in a studded cast. Like, it was Lawrence Fishburne, Ethan Hawke, mm. Maria Bello, mm. Drea de 
Mateo at the time that Sopranos was hitting. Oh, I know you Drea. Know? <laughs> I know Drea now. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it was like a class A group of people. And I felt so intimidated going into that space. And that movie actually was the movie that took me out of my survival job. I was working down on Sunset Boulevard at the hotel. At the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> And that audition came up, and I did the audition angrily. Like, <laughs> didn't even mean to like book the role, but kind of meant to book Why? the role. Why? Because I didn't like the breakdown. I thought the breakdown was 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 stupid. Tell I was, us what a breakdown is. The breakdown was like looking for a Detroit gang member, female gang member, real gang members preferred. I said, "Where about now?" Oh wow! What? Oh, Why? Okay. Why would we do that? Come Why? on, now Hollywood does some crazy Listen, stuff. Sis, sometimes I was so irritated. I was like, "Wait, what? You gonna what? oh make, okay, make so it I, make sense?" Yeah, so I get why you were like. I mean, I guess I'll do I'm this. I'm like, little. I just you know how I'm still paying to you know like this college money to study this craft, and you want to just pull a gang member from the gang <laughs> into this, <laughs> this movie. <laughs> To what? To authenticate this? Is that what you think you're doing? I was so mad. So I was like, I know what they think they want to do, uh-huh. but they have no idea. You know, mm. like, stop it. Yeah. So it's like, if you're telling the story of a mass murder, real mass murder is preferred. <laughs> like, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I go to this audition and I remember because I was a youth leader, one of the youth from church who was out here like on a on a school spring break or whatever. I was like, come with me to this. Because I wanted him to kind of see wow. and experience what this world, you know, was like. Yeah. So he came with me to the audition and I remember throwing chairs in there and like going mad. Oh, <laughs> crazy. Whoa. And I remember feeling like, okay, now we can go. And we left and I was satisfied with myself. Like, don't you dare undermine the work that we can do. You know, what you're not asking for a gang member. What you're asking for is the underbelly of these people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that is something that can be present in any person who is broken, who is looking for community, who didn't have a shot, you know, in life and, and found that community in this. So I was like, be be very clear. Yeah. So after we left, um, got the call that, you know, I had gotten this role. And so I was like, oh, so I went away to Toronto to shoot the movie. Mm. It was like a three-month long commitment. And man, I thought I was rich. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I even got a little like Girl, shimmy in my shoulder. I was I like, said, Ooh. what? They was paying me $25,000 for three months for a fee. I said, oh. now that I know, <laughs> now that I know, Ash... Good girl, but you couldn't tell me I wasn't rich. Did you get residual or did we get residuals? Girl, we get some residuals, okay. but it's like 78 cents. It's okay, fine. got it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was an experience that provided intel and insight that I needed to take with me for the journey. Mm. Because from that experience, there was a woman who was on the project. I think she was working as uh, Lawrence Fishburne's assistant at the time. Her name was Crystal Cruz. As we were coming to the close of the project, I started having anxiety, like, oh, my God, I'll never be hired again. This was a fluke. Bah, 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 bah. And she said, oh, no, 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 Aisha. She said, no, you'll work again and again and again. She said, they just don't know that they want you. So go in there and just know that you'll change their mind. Don't go in there trying to be what you think they want go in there and change their mind. And she was so right. Like, she was like, just be your authentic self. Mm. And so I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to do that. And you did. And I did. And then, okay, so that, so... By the time Harriet came along, so by so, the time, so it's many years. You were working, 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 working. Okay, we know that. Your IMDb is like, scroll, 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 scroll. <laughs> oh, it has a tab to go to the next page. Okay, got it. Next page. <laughs> I mean, right. so, okay, but so Underground comes along. So Underground comes along and it shifts the trajectory of my career and what I care about. Mm. Because now it's like, oh, you can actually care about the things that you do, you know? Yeah. and. I had had, you know, small bursts of that, 
you know, with other people and other projects, but nothing on the level of like underground. And I remember watching underground and being such a big fan of the first season of it. And so not only was it something that I would be entering and shaping from the beginning with other people, but something that had impacted me. And I was like, oh, that's good. So when it came around, I didn't even see myself as Harriet Tubman. I remember watching the show and in the end of the first season, them teasing the intro of Harriet. And I wasn't even like, oh, I wonder who that's going to be. Man, I, I wonder if I should put... Because at this, at this point in my career, people had started strategizing their their roles. Like, oh, this person's working on this. And, and I, I didn't come up in that era of like, oh, let me send an email to such and such and tell them, you know, this is why I should be considered for this role. And uh-huh. I came up in the era of like... Hey, what are you guys submitting me for? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and then trusting your agent yes. to 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 craft and to do it career. all, really. Yeah. And we yeah. just do the, the, the acting work. And we work, just show up, but, right? And yeah. do the acting work. And it's mm. like, you know. And so I started to learn, you know, like, oh, this is what people are doing now. So it didn't even cross my mind to be like, oh, who's on, who's the creator of this? And who's, the, you know, who's the degree? Didn't even realize. And wow. it took Anthony, like, coming to me like, listen, I think you should make a a, a ploy for, 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 for Harriet. You should take a go. I really want you to play Harriet. And I was like... The same person that basically the introduced us. The same person that introduced us, actually. Wow. Wow. It's good to have a person. It's good. To, and so he was my person, mm. you know. And But it had to obviously go through more than him. Yes. But he planted the seed of possibility in my mind. And I was like, oh, I never, I didn't, I never thought of myself as playing Harriet Tubman because I had been a working actress who always did a certain kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. And so I had gotten into a rut of doing a certain kind of thing and not imagining myself for any other thing. Your performance as Harriet on Underground, we actually talk about it, like the team on the pod. We've talked about it. That's just one of the best performances in television history. Mm, thank you, Ash. I mean, it's 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 true. I remember, I remember the premiere. I was at the premiere. I remember, and that's what's so cool. You have to have friends that you're inspired by. I remember being like, wow, like, this is amazing. I'm at my friends, like, Hollywood premiere. It was at that uh, theater at, near mm-hmm, UCLA. Mm-hmm. And it was a big, I have a picture of me in front of the poster with you with that gun. And I was like, I just was so, it was in that, I remember vividly thinking, if Aisha can do it, I can do it. Mm-hmm. If Aisha can do it, I can do it one day. I can do it. Yeah. You were the front runner to win all of the awards. Everybody in town was talking about how Aisha Hines is going to sweep up everything because, like I said, it was one of the best performances in television history. If you want to fight me on it, please <laughs> do. Bomb. My <laughs> boxing gloves are on. Like, literally, right? So, what was that experience like? And how how did it really feel to go through that? What I did was open my eyes to possibility. Now I knew what was possible. Mm. Someone entrusted me with something, and I was not going to disappoint, you know? And so when I then started to consume, like, the literature and the books and the history, then it became like, oh, Harriet entrusted me with this. Yeah. I cannot disappoint. You know, yeah. like I then realized the magnitude of the moment and how important it was, like I talked about earlier, for this generation to even sip her spirit even a little bit mm. so that we can become modern day Harriets, just have a portion of her courage, yes. a portion of of her resilience, yeah. you know, like, and she did these things in sight of the danger that was in sight of and in spite of the danger mm. that was before her, that was behind her, that she, and so I was just like, man, if this is how this makes me feel, mm. I'm sure this would be valuable for 
this generation and where we are in the world right now. And so it was an act of like surrender and service to do it. Mm -hmm. On the back end, in terms of like going through the award season and stuff like that, I had never done that before. So I didn't know what to expect, Mm -hmm. you know? So I didn't, my body didn't even really prepare for disappointment. I was Mm -hmm. just like somewhere in the middle there and showing up for each moment and each event as much as I could, but like still feeling a very spiritual connection to the experience and not wanting to sort of pervert it for the industry, yes. you know? Yeah. And so I was like, they, you know, it's on them. But, you know, it wasn't lost on me that what we did was groundbreaking in terms of the medium of television. Mm-hmm. And so I thought at the very least yes. that that would be acknowledged and honored. And so I remember writing in my journal, like, this is this is the kind of work that I know deserves to be acknowledged, honored, and in this case, awarded. But this is also the kind of work that is not defined by said award. (laughs) Yes, Aisha. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And so I know that this is destiny work. And I know that those who are meant to see and experience this mm. work. And I know that the seeds that this work have planted will create yes. more for generations to come. So, kind of closing, I want to talk about this season of your life right now. Mm-hmm. We talked a lot about family. So I want to talk about, actually, I want to, I want to know, have you thought about the fact that in weeks... You're creating your own family. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even think it's something that I even need to think about. It sort of is. Yeah. You know, it sort of is. Um, And what is beautiful is that this family has been established Mm. for so many years. You know. How long have you um, all known each other? Since we were 16 years old. I went from calling his mom Auntie Shirley because that was the context under which I met her because she was the aunt of my best friend, Jalene. And so she'd be like, oh, I'm going by Aunt Shirley, Aunt Shirley. And Aunt Shirley was a um, beautician. She owned her own salon on Church Avenue. And so we, when me and Jolene would walk home from school, we always passed Aunt Shirley's salon. So to go from calling her Aunt Shirley to mom is insane oh. and so beautiful. She's my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> um, but it just, yeah, you know, th- this the family unit has been there for a long time and now it's just being intentional yes. about how we will actually operate as family, mm-hmm. you know, and what role we'll play in each other's life as family. What's your favorite thing about your fiancé? It's so interesting because, like, almost sometimes <laughs> my most favorite thing is also the thing that I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> 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 relatable, relatable. <laughs> Ditto. But it, there's so many wonderful things about him, really, honestly. But he is such an optimist about mm-hmm. all things, you know, that it keeps my spirit calm, you know, in, in times where, you know, my spirit might start to to unravel. But at the same time, I'm like, you need to be real about this, (laughs) you know, like, but it just, but I think that that energy sometimes is a balancing energy, you know, and I think that it, it is a beautiful space because we both don't need to be, to be frantic. Yeah. Um, What has been your takeaway from our conversation, Ish? God, there's so many takeaways, but I think, I guess to encapsulate it. It's it's probably just that the journey may not always be joyful, but there's always there's always like you said, I guess angels, helpers along the way, you know, to help you through those 
through those times and usher you towards that joy. So we're just so connected because my takeaway is to be more mindful of the people that God has placed in my life and why. Mm. It's, it speaks to the, it speaks mm-hmm. to that story. Mm-hmm. It's something about that story will always stick with me for the rest mm-hmm. of my life. It's just I'm all God always has somebody mm-hmm. in every room that I enter. Mm-hmm. E- every place that I go. Yeah. He's he sent an advocate for me. Yeah. And maybe it's not always even up for me to to recognize. Yeah. It's just for me to embrace and and have a confidence yeah. in that I'm covered yeah. with someone that he sent specifically yeah. for me. Yeah. That is empowering in a way that I really, 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 really needed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, Ash, this has been... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Ish. Ash, this... No, honestly, this has been <laughs> really replenishing, mm. you know, and... My restoring. work for the year. Yeah, which is interesting because, you know, sometimes it can just be found in in connecting through conversation, mm-hmm. you know, that we have a moment to restore one another, to reflect on the journey, you know, of our lives individually and collectively um, yeah. in relationship to one another. But just sharing with you has been truly restoring and I feel full and I'm grateful that you gave me this opportunity to do this with you. I love you. Oh, I love you too, sister. Well, most importantly, thank you for saying yes. <laughs> and I just, you Duh. know, I, yeah, <laughs> but I, I love you. I thank you. I honor you. And I'm so excited for the world to know a little bit more about someone who's one of the most important people in my life. After the credits, Aisha tells us about the icon who she thinks most deserves to lay out and be loved on. Stay with us. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lentigua. Its senior editor is Verilyn Williams. Sound designer is Cedric Wilson. Managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Assistant producers are Michelle Baker and Shanice Tyndall. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you do, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcast to ensure you hear the next one. If you could take Harriet Tubman to Grenada Ooh. and Brooklyn, Ooh. Where's the first place you take her and what are y'all talking about? Listen. <laughs> For those, you guys can't see this, but she just uh, scratched her eyebrow, which means she's about to get into the tea. <laughs> Listen, all right. So if we are taking Harriet Tubman to Grenada, first thing we're doing is probably going to the beach. We're going to go to that good old Grand Anse and we're going to replenish Harriet, okay? Because she put in work. And she deserves, she deserves to lay out and be loved on. She deserves, she yeah. deserves a frozen drink in one hand. She mm. deserves a foot massage. <laughs> if anyone deserves a, a foot, foot massage, massage, it is great Mother Harriet. Oh my goodness. And we're just going to take care of her. And I think that she would value, you know, the people of Grenada and, and their kindness and their goodness. One of the things that I just loved about her legacy was like after she was the Harriet that everybody knows like she settled um up in uh I can't remember maybe Albany New York or something and literally like opened a home to like help the elderly and I'm like she never stopped never stopped you know to her last breath now Brooklyn is a different story <laughs> 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 you 
know, these United States is a little raggedy. <laughs> what still. So are you might... <laughs> and Harriet doing in Brooklyn? In Brooklyn, we might have to still head. We might have to head over to them good courthouses and really knock on some doors Ooh. and figure out, you know, how to really shake up the system as it currently exists because it's still pretty perverse. It's still pretty biased. It's still pretty dangerous for Black people to exist yeah. in these spaces. And so I, I think in Brooklyn, I'd be like, Harry, you might have to roll up your sleeves a little bit and you might have to, you know, you might have to give a TED Talk to the new generation mm. and kind of give us some pointers on how to Harriet in these times. Yeah. And, you know, they're not going to say no to Harriet. They're not. They're not going to say no, no to Harriet. They can't say no Harriet to Harriet. Harriet wasn't accepting any no. Yeah, so <laughs> she would be like, okay, but yeah. after this, we're hopping on the plane to Grenada, right? <laughs> He's like, yes. 